Every programming language has a concept of variables. And these variables are basically just an abstraction that allows us to store the data under some name. And these data can be anything. They can be a number of students in a certain C++ class, or a speed of a vehicle driving on a highway, or maybe a distance from Earth to the Moon. So, really anything. Today we're going to be talking about how to create variables in C++, what they are, and a little bit of uh, how to work with them and some pitfalls that can happen because of uh, wrong creation of those variables. Let's get going. Today's lecture is going to be mostly uh, slide heavy. So I'm going to be showing the slides uh, side by side to my face and uh, we'll be explaining what, what we can do with variables and how to create them in C++ so that you are ready to store some information in them afterwards. I will be using emojis on the slides uh, a lot and they will basically show a couple of things. We will cover what is the best style to, uh, like say, to name something or to organize the data around. We will also be using some software design features probably not in this lecture, but in the lectures to come. I will also outline what is not a good practice and will try to outline what will not compile when it comes to code or what shouldn't be done when it comes to just uh, a certain statement. Finally, there's going to be some uh, attention grabbers like alerts or, or hints um, that you're going to be able to follow up and make sure that, that this is important, you have to know it uh, for sure. And whenever I'm talking about style or about software design, I will mostly use uh, either Google style sheet, so Google C++ style sheet for basically naming, organizing the code and whatever else. And uh, we'll also sprinkle into it a little bit of the CPP core guidelines, which are used for making sure that the code is following the best practices available to us as a C++ community overall. I would like to bring this course to as many people as possible. And for that, I need your help. So please like, subscribe, and tell your friends. Thanks, and enjoy this video. That allows us to now actually start talking about how to create a variable. And uh, in order to create a variable, you need to provide it a type. So C++ is a typed language, a strongly typed language at that. So every variable will have a type. And uh, whenever a variable has a type, it cannot change it. So if you set a variable to a certain type, whatever you set to it afterwards has to be of the same type, otherwise it will either be converted to the type of that variable or will just not compile. So the compiler will just not allow this. There are multiple ways to create a variable uh, in C++, and you can see them all on the screen right now. Basically, you can create a variable uninitialized, this is generally not a good idea, and we will cover it in a couple of minutes why exactly this is not a good idea. So for now I just show it for the, com for the completeness, but don't do it. Um, the better way is to set the value to your variables straight away. And to do that, you basically have four different uh, ways to do this. You can uh, use the equality sign, or the equal sign, which is basically the assignment operator in C++, and you can instantly assign it a value. You can use the curly brackets either with a value inside or without. If you're using the value inside, it, you basically provide a value explicitly. If you don't use a value uh, inside, um, it's called value initialization, at least for the symbol types. And uh, you basically set it to a certain default value um, which is well defined. Finally, you can use the, um, the round brackets, which is very similar to the curly brackets, but it is a little bit of a old style. So before C++11, it was hard to use curly brackets to initialize anything, so, uh, or at least the normal variables. So you kind of had to use the round brackets, but now it's uh, not the case anymore, and I believe that this style kind of dies off uh, slowly. So probably don't use it, but if you do, there is just one caveat that you have to be aware of, but we're going to cover it later. For now, please just use either the equal sign or the curly brackets. The next thing to think about whenever you create a variable is how to name this variable. 
and uh, the names uh, cannot start with a number or with uh, any form of a, uh, of a symbol, they must start with a letter. Um, this is a strong requirement from C++. Um, also, C++ um, names or names of the variables in C++ are case sensitive. So if you name your variable with different cases, uh, let's say you capitalize random letters in your variable name, that is going to be a different variable name and C++ will treat it as such. So, uh, for example, if you have this small variable uh, with the underscore and uh, you want to uh, change, say, the V in the variable to the uh, to the capital one, to the capital letter, uh, it's going to be a different uh, variable, but I hope you got the gist of it. It is important though to uh, think about how, how you name those variables. Uh, the variables uh, uh, have to have a meaningful name, and this is not related to C++, or it's not related just to C++. It is related to other programming languages as well. So, use meaningful names for your variables. Do not use names like a, B, C, D, and whatnot, unless these are some coefficients of a certain mathematical model. And I have seen this happening a lot from people who come from more scientific computing backgrounds. They tend to use shorter names that have less of a meaning when you read the code. In the end of the day, the code is meant to be read, so try to write it so that within three months, when you forget everything about it, you could come back and read it. So do give your variables meaningful names. That also means that the variable names will probably become longer with time. Some variables will have more information in them and that will inevitably lead to longer names. And this is fine. Nowadays we have text editors that help us uh, write code, that they can autocomplete the variable names, uh, even if they're a bit longer. By the way, if you're interested in uh, knowing how to set up semantic autocompletion for C++, leave a comment below and uh, we can talk about this in a separate video. On the note of naming the variables, I suggest you to follow a style guide of uh, how you would name those variables. And uh, again, we will follow Google style, uh, style guide here. We will name the variables in snake case. Well, snake case basically stands for all the words with just the lowercase letters and uh, the words would be split with the, with the underscore symbol. That's as simple as that. Finally, there are two things that you uh, should probably be aware of. Um, depending on which language you come from uh, right now, you might be tempted to use the type as part of your variable name. So uh, if it's like an integer type, you would be tempted to put an int into your, uh, into your variable. Don't do that. The type is already stored in the type of your variable and this variable will always have exactly this type, so there is no need for this redundant information whatsoever. Finally, especially when we come to, um, to variables that represent like true and false statements, do not use negation in the name of your variables. Um, we humans, we are not really good at dealing with double, triple and quadruple negations, at least I am not. Um, and uh, if you name your variable with a negation and then you would like to negate this variable at some point, this is double negation already and then it's again hard to read. So if you keep in mind that the code is meant to be read, I think you're going to be fine. So I mentioned the types of the variables. Um, we have to provide the type of the variable and let's start talking about what these types can be. There is actually a lot of types in C++ as built in, but there are also types that we can write as uh, the users of the language. We will talk about these custom types later in the course, uh, in one, two or three videos uh, down the line. But uh, for now, let's talk about the built-in types. And the built-in types are called fundamental types in C++. And they basically consist of a number of types, and most of them are now on the screen. So it all starts with the void type. The void type basically means just that. It means it's nothing. It represents nothingness, and we cannot create a variable of this type. Uh, for now, it doesn't seem to be very useful, but it will become much more useful when we get to, uh, to write functions of our own. The next type I would like to talk to is Boolean type. It uh, has a keyword bool in C++, and this Boolean type basically just represents true or false statements. Uh, something can be either true or false, that's a good fit for a Boolean variable. 
Uh, next, we can talk about the character types. Uh, they are represented by the word uh, char or car. I've heard people use different ways to pronounce this word. And they represent either some form of characters, like for example, the letter H would be a character, or a character turn symbol would also be a character. We will see this in examples uh, soon. Uh, they also can be used to represent raw data, and of course we will also cover this in the course, but much later when we start talking about raw memory towards the end of the course. Okay, the most interesting types though would be the integer type and the floating point uh, type. The integer type is kind of split into two parts. There is the signed variant of it and the unsigned variant of it, and these numbers basically just represent the integer numbers. At the same time, um, these integer numbers can uh, have different ranges. So we might want to represent a range of uh, relatively small numbers and want them to be smaller in, to have a smaller footprint in the memory, or we would like to represent bigger numbers that would of course then occupy a little bit more memory. I don't think that for now we have to care about those things too much, but just for the sake of uh, completeness, here are all the, um, all the types that you can use um, that you can use for the integer type. And then when we talk about the, uh, the floating point type, we basically mean two types. It's float and double. Float means the single precision of the floating point number, and double means the double precision of the floating point number. So basically double is more precise than float. And again, we will cover this in much more detail later in the course. Okay, so let's look at this uh, small example of how to create different types of variables and uh, uh, of, different, uh, of different types. Uh, we can start by creating like a, a character return symbol, uh, which is the, uh, the char um, symbol. And uh, you, can, you can see that we, we specify that it's a char variable, we name it caret return, we use the equality sign to assign it a value, and this value is the caret return symbol. So if we will ever print this variable to the terminal, what it will print, it will print a certain character that will make the caret go to the next line in the terminal. That's it. And the same goes for the integer, which is one line below. So if we want to set the meaning of life into the integer, we can set it to 42, of course. Or um, we can also use the short uh, type right underneath that. Um, that works exactly the same way. And here for this smaller uh, int, uh, I do break my own rule here of not putting an int into the name of the, uh, in, into the variable, but this is basically for illustration purposes. I hope we will get to to more complicated examples in there, I promise I will not do this. Here we use the curly brackets to initialize the value, um, and this is exactly as valid as the line above. So generally, if you look at this slide, uh, you will see a lot of values uh, initialized here and there, um, and uh, we will get to that in the live coding session um, towards the end of this video. I think of interest here is uh, to, to outline a couple of things which might be a little bit uh, different from, from the others. So for example, when we create a floating point number, we specify an f in the end of the value that we use to initialize it. This f is called a literal. And uh, this literal basically tells that the 0, 0, 1 before it is a floating point number. So there is no con conversion happening, and the compiler knows that 001f is a floating point number. And you can use either a small letter or a big letter in this particular case. This plays no role. If you want to create a double number, you just uh, write a decimal number, and you do not have to specify any form of literal, and uh, the compiler by default knows that this is a double number. Finally, when we, when we want to set the boolean number, we can just set it to either false or true, and we can write it out. And these are um, special words in C++ that we can use to initialize those variables. Also, the same story holds for the unsigned uh, variants of, uh, of the integer types. 
so I don't think we have to go through them. It's just one remark here is that we can also use literals there. So if we use the U, uh, that means unsigned. If we use the L, that means long. So for example, if we want to create an unsigned long, long number, we're gonna type, uh, say, 42 ULL, right? I hope it makes sense. Oh yeah, and one thing that I forgot to, to talk about is we can use auto. Auto is a word that basically tells, hey compiler, figure out which type I mean here. And uh, uh, the compiler can figure out this type uh, easily, especially when you provide the literals in your numbers. So as I told you before, if you provide an F, it's going to be a floating point number and the compiler will know about this. So you can just write auto some float number and just specify the 13, for example, dot zero F. And the compiler will know that it's a float, floating point number and a float at that. Additionally, you can also set the value of uh, a new variable from an old variable that you used before. So if you have already a number uh, which, you, which you've stored in another variable, you can use it to initialize uh, the new variable. And you can see that in the, uh, in the line below, like the lowest line on the slide, uh, where we basically initialize a new number called explicit copy by a number that we set, uh, set before. And I think at that, um, this is everything you have to know about how to create simple variables. We do have to talk a little bit here about the differences in the integer types. I did hint on that uh, before, and even though we won't go into how they're represented in the memory for now, um, I want to basically give you a feeling of how to, how to find how big of numbers can be represented in this or the other integer format. And for that we can, we can include the limits uh, header into our code and use a function max and min which is stored in the numeric limits. So basically um, here on the slide you can see an example of how to call this and you can do it with any type that you want. So if you want, instead of int, to put a short there, it will work just the same. It will work a little bit differently, especially with the minimum for the floating point numbers, but it's going to be very similar for all the other integer numbers that you can come up with. So here we would print as an, as an output the minimum and the maximum number that can be represented by, in this particular case, the integer type. And here we are using the printf function it's just a function from the CSTD EO include, and uh, it's used to print stuff on the screen. Before we were using the put as function, but uh, or puts, the puts function basically just uh, uh, puts a string onto the onto the terminal. Uh, we don't have a string here, so we have to use something else. And the way printf works, it's kind of very similar, but a little bit different. The way it works, it uh, takes a format string, which is what you see uh, as the first line uh, in the printf, and then it takes values to replace the placeholders in the format string. And this format string requires you to know which types you are planning to, uh, to output. So in this particular case, we want two uh, integers, and for that we use percentage %d uh, to indicate that there is going to be an integer there and we provide it afterwards. There are other ways to print stuff on the screen in C++. We will talk about those uh, later in the course. Uh, for now, uh, this is going to be good enough for us. And I do find it uh, a good starting point for beginners because it makes you think about the types that you're using and it makes you understand um, what type a certain variable has before you print it to the screen. So with this, I urge you to uh, take this example, run it locally and try to play with maybe different types and get a feeling of how big and small of a numbers they can represent. One important thing that I wanted to talk about whenever we talk about variables is that you always have to initialize your variables. Well, there is a small caveat to this. Sometimes you would leave a variable uninitialized for performance reasons, but this is more of an advanced topic and we will get into this. The rule of thumb here, always initialize your variables. Before you start optimizing your code, you will have to measure if this is the bottleneck of your code. And usually it's not. So please always 
always, always initialize your variables. And again, if you don't want to provide a, uh, an explicit value to your initialization, you can always use value initialization. It's a bit of a confusing name, but what it basically means, it, it will set the variable to the default uh, value if you just provide the empty curly brackets after its name. Uh, that's kind of it. So, and uh, on the slide you can see a bunch of examples that work with different fundamental types, and it works with all of those. So, just to make it make, make sure that we understand that initializing a variable is important, I want to show why it is important to initialize a variable. And the reason for this is that if you don't, then basically it just grabs some memory, and whatever lies in that memory will now become this variable. So it will be interpreted as an integer, as a double, as a float, as a bool, as whatever you want to put in that variable. And uh, it will be garbage, because memory is just randomly sampled ones and zeros, and however they are interpreted is gonna be, is gonna influence what number we are getting. So, in our case, uh, what I would like to, to do is I want to show a small example of uh, how this happens. So let's say we create a double and we leave it uninitialized. Now let's just try to print it out, right? It's very simple. And we will use a scientific notation to print it out because it gives us a little bit more precision. For that, we will use the percentage %e in the format string of the printf. So this is basically the whole program to showcase how important it is to initialize these values. If we run this program multiple times, we will always get a different answer. The reason for this is what I explained before that whenever we create a double, it will grab some memory and will interpret it as a double number. And this double number will always be different, or very likely will always be different, because the memory that it grabbed will just contain something that is left over from previous runs of other previous programs and whatever else happened to that memory. So, when we print it out, it's kind of fine to get different values, we don't rely on them. But if we now would use this double in a certain calculation, let's say we want to send a rocket to the moon and we need a double to represent the distance to the moon, for example, if we just leave it uninitialized and forget to initialize it at some point, we will basically run into what is called the undefined behavior. And this is very important. Undefined behavior is the worst thing that can happen to you in C++. So if you can avoid generating a situation where you can get into the undefined behavior land, do it. Don't ever create the undefined behavior uh, in your code. It's very hard to debug because it's basically random. Your code will randomly work, randomly fail, and it takes weeks and weeks to debug things like this, especially when your programs become bigger. Whenever we create a new variable, we will call it initialization, and whenever there is no new variable created due to our operation, that is going to be assignment. If you do not want to change the values of your, of your variables, like ever, you want this particular value to stay exactly the same, then you can use either const or const expr. And these might be a little bit confusing because they're so similar. Const means constant, const expr means constant expression. The difference between them is that constant can happen at runtime of your program, while const expression must happen at compile time of your program. And that's basically the whole difference. So you can set any variable to be constant. Sometimes it will be available during the compilation time, but sometimes not. While if you set something to be a const expression, it absolutely must be available during the uh, compilation time. And uh, on this slide you can see a bunch of examples. So you can see that you can set a bunch of constants from initialized from other constants and from other variables, while if you try to initialize a const expr from a constant, you will run into issues because uh, uh, the compiler will complain that, hey, this doesn't look like a constant expression to me, so I cannot initialize another constant expression from it. But we can initialize it from numbers because the literals that represent these numbers are basically constant expressions for the compiler. So at this you might be wondering, when to use what? When do you use const and when do you use const expert? 
And while this is a little bit of a complicated question when it comes into, like when we get into details and details and details of C++, there is a good rule of thumb that I think you can use for now uh, until you get a little bit more feeling of your own about this. This rule of thumb is actually quite simple. If you can use const expert, do it. If you cannot, then use const. If you then cannot use const, well then you have to use the actual normal variable. And usually that's because you actually want to change it in your code. So, const expert, const normal variable. Uh, if you don't change a variable, it really should be either const or const expert. That's it. That's a very simple rule. I think it will bring you uh, pretty far already, and then there are some small caveats that you will get to know with time. And just maybe one more thing that I wanted to talk about, just to make sure that we avoid the confusion of what is compile time, what is runtime. It's actually very simple. So from the moment we start the program, this is runtime. We start it from the terminal, right? We call the program from the terminal. This is when the runtime starts. And a lot of times we care a lot about the runtime of our program, especially when we have to make some significant computations. We um, actually want it to run as fast as possible. Um, while whenever we talk about the compile time, that's the time from the moment that we called the compiler, from the moment that we started compiling our code, to the moment that all the binaries are created. That's compile time. There is no good and bad among those. Sometimes you need one, sometimes you need the other, but this is basically the distinction. In addition to these uh, normal fundamental types, we can do something a little bit more complicated with them. We can set references to these types. And again, for now, there is really not that much use uh, of them for us, but it will be whenever we start talking about functions. But I want to cover it here nevertheless. Basically, a reference is uh, kind of like an alias to your, um, to your variable, and whatever happens to the reference happens to that variable, and vice versa. Whatever happens to the variable happens to all its references. Reference is part of your type. So if you create a reference to your variable, this variable will not have the type, let's say I create a reference to float, this reference will not have a type float, it will have a type float reference. And um, to illustrate this small example, um, we can basically create, let's say we create some integer, and then we create a reference to this, uh, to this integer, and if we change this reference, so we set a new value uh, into this reference, it will also change the original number because they basically represent the same thing. If you're wondering why we need references, they will become very handy when we use functions and they are mostly used to avoid copying big data. In our case, our fundamental types are all pretty small, but we will quickly learn more complicated types that will take a lot more memory and we don't always want to copy those, uh, those types over, so that's where the references can be useful. And of course, if you want to kind of get the best of all worlds and you want to uh, be able to provide a reference uh, to somebody while not allowing them to change it, you can of course use const with your references. So basically now you can, you can take a reference of something, set it to const, and now the type of this reference will be const original type reference, right? So it, it's also part of the type of that particular variable, or constant for that matter. And this way you can basically create a constant reference, you can pass it over to somebody, they can use your variable, uh, but they will not be able to change this. Um, in other programming languages, this mechanism is called borrowing, and this is a very strong mechanism, and in most cases, most of your variables, you will be passing by const reference. But again, for now, we're kind of looking a little bit ahead here. For now, it's just important to remember that const ref is also a type, and uh, this type references the original variable, but doesn't allow you to change it. And again, here is a small example um, on the slide here that so it takes the constant reference to that variable and if we try to change that afterwards, it will not allow us, but if we do change the underlying variable, 
then the const reference will also return the changed value. And feel free to play around with this code, just copy it over into your editor and uh, try to do things and break it and see what the compiler says. Uh, in the end of the day, you have to gain the feeling of uh, what is allowed, what is not allowed and why it works a certain way. So go ahead and do it. One of the most important things about variables that we haven't talked about yet is that they live in scopes. And there is a bunch of scopes whenever you write a certain C++ program. It all starts with a global scope, which is outside of your main function and outside of any function for that matter. That is a global scope. Uh, anything that lives in that scope dies after your main function has uh, returned. And then within your main function, there will be other functions and every function will have its own scope. And the scopes are always created by, uh, they are created within the curly brackets. Not every pair of curly brackets create a scope. Sometimes they're used to basically initialize a variable instead. But uh, all scopes are created within the curly brackets. And you can have scopes inside of scopes inside of scopes. And when you have an inner scope, you can actually shadow variables from the outer scope. We will play it out in a live coding session afterwards if it gets confusing. But for now, it's just important to understand that every variable lives in a scope. And when I say lives in a scope, it means that when the scope ends, so when the curly bracket closes, then that variable that belongs to this or lives in this scope, it dies or gets its memory gets freed. And this is the main, main, main part of how the C++ memory model works. This is what makes it so useful in systems programming and uh, this is why it doesn't have any form of garbage collector that just rolls through your programs, through your runtime and picks up stuff that you don't need anymore. Because you can write code so that anything that you don't need gets destroyed at a certain point in your program. It is a very important concept, but we will hammer it down time after time in multiple videos uh, over this course. For now, let's just look at this small example and you can see that we have a const expert, uh, constant uh, the k global variable, it lives in the global scope, so it will die after the main has finished. Then the main has its own scope in which we have some float and we set some value to it. Then we create an inner scope within that and we set uh, a new sum float which shadows the old sum float to a new value. And if we print it there, we will get a new value there. We can also create new variables in that inner scope. And both the shadow of sum float and this another float, they will both die by the end of the, of the first of the, this inner scope, right? So by the end of the inner scope, the only thing that survives is the original sum float. And uh, feel free to change this example and add the printf statements to just see what these values actually are, uh, because it really, um, you really have to build the intuition about how the scopes work. This is the core principle behind C++ and you really have to understand this. So take this example, copy it over in your, in your editor and uh, try to play around with this. Finally, when we return from the um, from the main function, then the sum float, the original sum float dies, and uh, uh, that's where we cleaned up all of our memory, all the memory that our program used. You might have noticed that we had this global constant outside of main, and it was named in a different way. It was definitely not named in snake case. And the reason for this is that uh, the Google style sheet um, uh, recommends to, uh, to name the variables uh, differently if they, if they are constants. So whenever we want to define a constant or to declare a constant, we would uh, name it differently. We would name it in camel case and we, will, we would put a small k at the start uh, of the name. Now you might wonder what to do with a constant that you use inside of, your, uh, in, inside of your functions, inside of your inner scopes. And the answer is you can basically pick the way you like it more. So if you look at the, uh, at the Google style sheet for C++, you will see that uh, they recommend either using the, the constant naming convention or using the snake case uh, naming just as if you would name variables. In this particular code, I will be mostly using snake case for the local scope constants and will use the camel case with the leading K for the global scope uh, constants.
Whatever you do, just pick one way and stick to it and uh, you're gonna be fine. The final thing that I wanted to chat uh, before we jump into the, into the live coding session uh, is uh, the following. Um, you can do operations on those variables and these operations can vary in their complexity. We can perform our arithmetic operations on the arithmetic types and uh, character, integer and the floating point numbers are all arithmetic. That, which means that we can use the plus, minus, uh, multiply or divide them and in some cases we can even use the modular division. We can also compare those types, we can uh, compare if something is smaller than the other type or bigger than the other type um, and whatnot. I hope it all uh, just naturally makes sense to you, just as you would compare any numbers. Finally, there is also uh, increment operations and decrement operations and there are shorthand uh, writings for this in C++. So you can, for example, if you have an integer a, you can write a plus equals 1 and it's exactly the same as to write a equals a plus 1 or a assign a plus 1. And the same holds for the minus equals and divide equals and multiply equals. You just have to be careful when you use the unsigned integers. When you, uh, when you try to uh, compute a difference between the two numbers, if the second number is bigger than the first one, you will get a negative number, but the unsigned integers cannot represent a negative number. So what will happen is what is called underflow. You will basically get below zero, you can't represent this number, and uh, because of how the, uh, these operations are implemented, you will instead get a huge number. So for example, uh, here is again a small example here, and, and again feel free to take it and play a little bit with it. You can basically get a huge number even though you just subtract it to not very big numbers. Uh, so beware of that caveat, um, a lot of bugs come from this. And uh, to talk a little bit more about those different operations, you can use uh, uh, some other style of operations on the boolean variables, so you can have a logical or and logical and uh, and the logical negation. So just as a small example, we can define being happy by being not hungry and warm or just being rich. And uh, if you can read this uh, line of code on the slide now and it makes sense to you, then you basically understand the logical operations on the boolean variables. Additionally, for integers, we uh, have to be a bit aware of how they are divided um, because it's not like it is in other languages. Uh, in other languages, you might expect that if you divide 7 by, say, 2 or by 3, you will get um, a floating point number, but not in this case. It would be split into the integer part and the remainder. And the integer part of that answer would be a 2 and the remainder would be a 1. So you get the 2 by using the slash symbol, by using the 7 divide by 3, and uh, you get the 1 by using the 7 modular divide by 3. And modular division is the percentage sign. To build on top of what we discussed in the previous slide, even more of a shorthand operators for, uh, for integer types, if we want to increment or decrement them, would be the plus plus operator. You can put it uh, either in a postfix or in a prefix notation, meaning a++ or plus plus a, but they largely mean the same thing. There is slight difference between the two implementations, which is not important right now, but basically what it does, it just increments the value of this variable by one. So a++ is exactly as a plus equals one and exactly the same as a assign a plus one. The same holds for minus minus, of course. One thing to be aware of though is please do not use them together in one line as part of a certain operation. As example on the screen here shows, it's very hard to read. Um, like if I look at the code like this, the first thing I want to do is to find who wrote this and ask them why they thought, like what, what path in life brought them to the position where they wrote a code like this. And the second is I want to rewrite this. In the end of the day, it's much nicer to have a couple of lines of your code where everything is well structured and you can easily read it and you can understand what happens there than to save these empty space in order to and make it much harder for humans to read. So don't do this. Please split your 
increments into separate lines. And on that, we can jump into the live coding session to make sure that you can follow along whatever you want uh, to understand better. And maybe this format just works better for you. So let's look at most of those concepts um, reduced to a short live coding session. Let's roll. Okay, so we start again with our main function, as we always do. And uh, let's uh, start by creating some variables. I think the first thing I want to do is uh, I want to create a uh, const expr int. Yeah, let's do an int. Uh, chi meaning of life, because this doesn't change and we want to set it to 42. This would be like a constant. Then uh, uh, we can also have here some auto uh, alternative meaning of life. And we would say set this to, it would be just a copy. But uh, we would want to maybe change this. So we would add another 42 to it. And remember that plus equals basically just means uh, that we want to update the, uh, the value to be, uh, update the value of this variable with this uh, 42. Uh, and just to make sure that we are not doing something stupid, uh, let's also make sure that we can uh, print those variables by including cstdio. And I will use the printf function here, the std. Uh, so I want to type that uh, meaning of life is, and then I will just provide a percentage d here because it's a it's an integer and percentage d. Uh, means that we will we are expecting to print an integer here and here we will provide the k meaning of life for now and let's format the code uh, so what i did now is i just formatted the code with the with a clang format with the custom settings to make sure that everything fits on the screen here perfect now we can uh, again build this code a minus std equals c plus plus 17. We want to output our basic types binary and we will provide the basic types.cpp in order to build this. Okay, we can build this and if we try to now uh, run it, we will get that the meaning of life is 42. Um, if we want to output the alternative meaning of life, we can also easily do that. So uh, that comes out as uh, 84 and that works uh, pretty well. We can even go further and we can uh, maybe create a const auto reference to the, uh, to the, let's say it's borrowed meaning and let's uh, set it to uh, let's say alternative meaning of life. Okay, let me make the terminal a little bit smaller. And uh, let's also print this borrowed meaning here. So let's build the code again. And you can see that we get exactly the same value. And just to show that this value changes when we, when we change the underlying variable, uh, let's do just that. Let's uh, uh, let's copy. Let's copy the printout, and uh, let's let's change the alternative meaning of life. Let's say we don't want it to be 42. We want it to be uh, I don't know. Let's say we want it to be a zero. So now, if I build this code again. I will get a zero because I changed the underlying variable and my reference just references that variable. Um, at this point, it's a constant uh, reference. So if I try to change uh, it here and I try to compile my code, I will get an error. And this error basically reads that cannot assign to variable borrowed meaning with const qualified type 
const int reference. Just as I said, its type is const int reference. Not just int, not const int, not just int ref, it's a const int reference for now. And we cannot set it, so um, we uh, basically the, the compiler cannot compile this code. Let's maybe also sprinkle this a little bit more with the operation, so let's try to divide 8 by 5 as an integer and just to make sure that uh, just to uh, sorry this should not be the borrowed meaning this should be the alternative meaning of life let's build it and you can see that it gets a 1 if we for example change the 8 to 11 then uh, we will get a 2 and uh, if we want the remainder of that operation we can replace it with the percentage sign and now we will get uh, again a 1. Um, I hope it will make sense, basically 1 is just the, uh, the division but it just leaves the integer part of whatever is the result um, of, of that and the uh, percentage just gets the modular division of uh, 11 by 5 here. Okay, so I hope this uh, kind of all makes sense. We can also have these operations uh, everywhere, so if I would want to uh, do it here, I could also do it, and the same way uh, would also be here. So let's say I want to multiply 4 by 10 and plus 2. So all of those things uh, would still work, and uh, yeah, that seems to all be working exactly the same way. Okay, now I want to briefly show what happens if we leave something uninitialized. So let's say, uh, let's remove all that and uh, let's maybe create a... Uh, let's create uh, first like an integer. Uh, uninitialized variable and uh, let's leave it uninitialized. Let's try to print it out. And in most cases, if we try to do this... Um, oh, actually now we got lucky, I was expecting to get a zero there. In most cases, if you run it on your system, you will probably get a zero, because mostly our memory is empty. But in some places there is some data and it will be interpreted as an integer, and this is exactly what we see here. So now uh, this is just some random numbers, and uh, oh, I'm actually glad we got really lucky here. Because now we have uh, uh, basically random numbers here, but it's not guaranteed what they will be, and we can't rely on this information uh, anyway. And if we change this to, say, float, and it's going to be a floating point number, and we change the output, uh, yeah, we also have to change this string. I think for now I will just print a number here. Let me structure the code again. And by the way, what I do here is I basically have a key combination that just calls clang format to restructure the code for me. You could do it from the terminal, but uh, if you are using a text editor, like a modern text editor like VS Code or Sublime Text or whatever else you're using, you can probably integrate clang format into it. And in this particular case, in VS Code, you just have to install the clang format extension. Uh, it has zero setup, so everything will just work out of the box as long as you have Clank format installed on your system. Anyway, let's try to see the same thing that happens with the float. And now you can see that we are not lucky, so it's uh, gonna be always zero for now. And if I run it multiple times, it still is zero. It is not guaranteed. It could be anything. So if I now change this to, say, double, and uh, try to do this again. It's still zero, but if I changed it to scientific notation, so if I change my output to the scientific notation, build the code again and run it again, we would get again different numbers every time we run it. Um, right, so I hope it shows you that um, you should always initialize your variables, otherwise they will be in this undefined stage. And just to show that we can initialize these variables, uh, with the value initialization without actually providing any value to them, we can do this. And now if I run it, it will always be exactly zero. At this point, I think we covered most of the bases here, uh, to be honest. Uh, maybe one more thing that I wanted to show is... Uh, or actually, there is two more things, and they're both related to integers. Uh, 
uh, I would like to show the limits of some integers and for that I will include limits. Let me remove the constant here and uh, I will just create a couple of const int. Um, actually, I don't need those, right? I just need to print the three numbers. So I will have the minimum, the maximum, and, uh, and that's it, two numbers. Uh, that's all I need. Uh, let me structure the code again and uh, I will use the limit. So it's, uh, I need numeric limits of integer and I want the function maximum and I will do it again. So numeric limits of integer and I want a minimum. Oh, actually vice versa, right? So this is going to be minimum, this is going to be maximum. Okay, now if I build this code and if I print it, this is what we get as the output. So this is the minimum and the maximum number represented by the integer. If I now change this integer to an unsigned int, for example, then we're going to see different numbers. So let me build those and run. And, uh, oh yeah, of course, I'm using the wrong uh, output here, so it shouldn't be the D, it should be the U, because it's an unsigned number. Let me do that. And uh, you can see that the minimum is now zero, because I, I'm using an unsigned uh, number, but the maximum is, uh, actually it's twice the maximum that was there before. Um, and uh, we can also do this for other numbers. So for example, we can do here like a short and uh, let me just quickly change this back to, to D. And uh, again, this would be the minimum and the maximum number for short. And uh, feel free to do it for the other types. I don't want to do it for all the types uh, here. I really want you to take the keyboard in your hands and uh, do it on your own. Um, but that's kind of it. Um, finally, what I wanted to show is if I here leave, uh, like, let's say, result of operation, I will leave one number here, and let's say I want to, uh, to have something like 23 unsigned minus 42 unsigned. Um, so if I want to... Uh, output the result of this operation, I will get to the situation of the underflow, uh, the one that we discussed a little bit before. And maybe I should specify that uh, beware of the underflow. So uh, if I want to do something like this uh, and I build the code and I run it, I will get a huge number here. And this huge number is because I need some negative part and this negative part will be subtracted from the top of the range of what I can represent with my unsigned uh, numbers and uh, uh, this is what is printed here. If I now change this uh, to unsigned long for example and here too, right and now you can see that the number is even bigger because the maximum number represented by this uh, unsigned long is bigger. So that's kind of it. So. I think this covers everything that I wanted to, to cover in this pretty short live session. Thank you for your attention and see you in the next one. Bye!